It's a gorgeous day in February. It is right now running the boat minus 15 Celsius. The wind is very light right here. There's not a cloud in the sky. I can't think of a better day to get out for a hike. It's been a while since I've been out to get out for more than a couple of hours. So today's a longer hike, probably about 12, 13 kilometer round total. And my whole objective is to go out, find a place that I was at in the fall, sit down, test out one of my new wood stoves, have some lunch and coffee, of course, and hike back. And I thought you might be interested in following along. I have some new pieces of kit. This will be the first time in the woods for two of them. I'll share them all with you when, when we get uh, set up for lunch. But right now, as you can see, I'm just in a base layer and a heavy fleece jacket. Uh, it's just one of those things, even though it's minus 15, and the, because the wind is a little light, I can get away with just wearing a fleece over my base layer uh, that avoids perspiration and build up a perspiration, which is not a nice thing when it starts to chill off. So I do have my wool, a new wool that I want to share with you, strapped to my back backpack. And uh, yeah, follow along. I'll see what else there is to show you along the way. Hope you can hear me over any wind noise. I am looking directly north over Quarry Lake, Susie Lake. And the wind is coming right down the lake. Fortunate, it's very light right now. This is, without question, my favorite spot to stop and look any time of the year. Absolutely gorgeous. And the ice looks like it might be safe enough. Well, it is, it, it is safe enough. I have my ice spikes, so I think I'm going to avoid some of the icy trails and walk around the edge of the lake and save myself a little bit of backache and just keep a, an eye open for open water and I should be safe. Going way up there in the far corner. So part of the reason I came out today is because tomorrow will be a Saturday and I'll be leading a group out into the woods into this very area where I'm at right now. Uh, they want to work, do a winter workshop on celebrating um, celebrating sustainability, that's what it is. So they know I know the area and uh, I agreed to bring them out and talk to them about the wilderness area here a little bit and the importance of wilderness to the environment and to sustainability in all aspects. So I did agree to bring them out and I thought I'd better come out and reconnoitre the paths along the way. And I'm glad I did. I'm going to be telling them it's mandatory to wear some type of traction devices on their shoes. <laughs> Man, it is icy. And the ice has been created by our weather pattern as well as people coming out and tramping down the snow. But winter in Nova Scotia has changed. There's no question from my childhood to now Winter has changed. We would plunge into winter as a child. We would plunge into winter and we would be there until late April. <laughs> now, winter doesn't really start until January, when I mean like any snowfall or cold temperatures. And it ends a little early, late March, early April. It doesn't really get nice until May. But the temperatures and the snowfall patterns, all together different. And, and I know that's on, on record as well. But now what we get is we'll get some snow, maybe 10 to 15 centimeters. The occasional storm that runs up 30 or 40 centimeters, but they're becoming more and more rare. But within two days of that storm, we get rain. So the temperatures will go from well below freezing to well above freezing. The rain will come, wash and pack down a lot of snow, and then the temperatures drop again, and we go back into the deep freeze for like we are today. And it just makes for harsh, harsh hiking conditions. Beautiful, but you know, it's, I went out the other day and the snow was not quite up to my knees and it was just soft and I was wishing I had brought my snowshoes. It was just on the border of needing snowshoes. I'm glad I had my traction devices for my shoes because it would have been a near impossible task. Anyway, I just thought I'd share that, that uh, there will be a group out here tomorrow in hopefully beautiful weather like it is today to discuss sustainability. So when I started off this morning, I had a spot in mind where I wanted to be. It was a place that I had found in the fall, 
And I thought, yeah, this is great. I'll come back here. It's off trail well enough that no one's likely to come by and interrupt me. No one out here today anyway, which is beautiful, but I just wanted a little privacy. Well, I've just spent the last two hours searching for that spot. Things look different <laughs> when there's no leaves on the trees and there's snow on the ground. I've been bushwhacking. I've been walking on the lake trying to identify it from the lakeside. I'll find it, but now I'm just, I just want to stop and have lunch. So I may not find that spot today, but you know what? Look where I am. I'm in the middle of the woods, in the middle of the wilderness, not a cloud in the sky, not a breeze coming off of the lake, not another person around. I'm just going to sit myself down in the snow, get my little stove out, and have some lunch. So I apologize I didn't record doing all of that, but I have a kind of a, well, it's not a campsite. There's a few things laid out around me, a little bit of hardwood that I took off a broken branch split up. So I am going to get the fire going in the stove. Uh, I'll probably show myself getting that started. And then uh, I'll put lunch on and we'll have a little chat. Okay, so I, uh, I did get ahead of myself here. I didn't record getting the fire started here like I thought I might. But uh, I'm working at it. The wood is damper than I thought it would be. It's hardwood. It was a standing stick of hardwood, but obviously got a little wet and got a little frozen. So it's a little slow going, but it is starting to catch on now. So the stove that I have today is one of the things I wanted to share with you. It is brand new. Uh, this will be the first fire in it, the one I've got started here now. It is the Flex Fire from Germany. And the set that was sent to me is known as the Flex Fire 6 Premium. And basically there are two stoves included in the set and you build from a four-sided stove which is what I'm using today up to a six-sided stove and there are multiple configurations and different pieces that you can put together and uh, hence the name FlexFire and uh, I can't say much about it yet what I will say is that it is very simple very appears to be very durably built what the stove you're looking at now stands about seven inches high. It is a roughly the height of the firebox stove, but it is not as wide or as deep in the firebox. So it's tall and uh, right now it seems to have good airflow, good drafting. There is a burn grate and an ash plate underneath that. Uh, it's quite an interesting little stove. Again, I'm not going to pass any comments of judgment on it at all yet. I'm just trying to get my wood going so that I can get some lunch going. So as the fire does establish. I have my pot. My pot today is something new. Well, I've used it a few times. It is from the Pathfinder collection. And this one is the 48 ounce or 1300 milliliter pot. It's not a pot that you see a lot of people using, but it is in their lineup. Uh, I didn't intend on buying this pot. It, uh, it was sent to be by mistake. I had ordered the, the regular full-size bush pot. This one came. Now, I did end up with the bush pot, but it was easier to keep this than send it back. So I have it, now that I have it, I can appreciate it quite a bit. It's quite a nice size pot. Not as big as the Bush pot, but bigger than their 750 mil, 24, 25 ounce version, but almost identical. Butterfly handles, holes on the side, a split lid with our drain holes. It did come with the fish mouth spreader that I could use to hold it apart, but you have to push them apart for this. So I actually made one, a bale for this, out of a skewer and the bale works really well so that I can hang it over a fire. Uh, yeah, quite a nice pot. So I have been using it, but it just hasn't appeared in a video yet. But that's what I'm going to boil my water in today once the fire gets established. And while it is, I thought I'd share something with you. Most of you probably are already aware of this. A few of you may not be, but if you weren't, uh, this may be of interest to you. So when I did start out today, it was about minus 15 degrees. It's now about minus 12 degrees, so it's warmed up. Even at that, you would never know it. I'm sitting in the sunshine here. I'm getting a little bit of a chill on. I'll be putting my uh, wool on in a few minutes' time, but I'm sitting in the sun. There's not a breeze right now, which is absolutely gorgeous. But even so, at minus 15 degrees, you have to keep your water from freezing if you're out for any length of time. So what I have right here is an Outdoor Research insulated sleeves for putting an Nalgene bottle in. Now, I picked this up at Value Village because they're, they're a little bit costly, but they can be well worth having. The trick that I wanted to show you, and most of you may already know this, if you have an insulated bottle, it still works. This is not an insulated bottle, it's a regular Nalgene inside of here. 
but this insulated sleeve helps, is store your bottle upside down. And the reason for that, oh man, that's still nice and warm. I put hot tap water in that before I left, and that's about four hours ago, so it's still nice and warm. Good. The reason you put your bottle in upside down, even if you're just stored in your backpack upside down, make sure it doesn't leak, of course. The reason you do it is if the water's going to get cold enough to freeze, it'll freeze where the air is. So if it's upright like this and there's an air gap before the lid, that's where it starts to freeze first. And you don't want your threads freezing because it makes it just that much harder to get off. And then, of course, there's ice on top and you have to punch it through the ice. If you store it upside down, any, any frozen portions will be at this top and or at this part here and a lot easier to turn it right side up and pour it from. So that's all I have to do now. But this is still warm, tap warm. The pot does have markings in it and I do need 500 mils, two cups, perfect. All right, save the rest for coffee. Sure it's on tight before you put it in the uh, your sleeve or your pack. Put that aside, put the lid on. Don't think I'm going to need the bale here. That's nice. I uh, was looking to see if the pot would dampen the, the airflow down and create a lot of smoke. There's a tiny bit, but uh, there's still a lot of airflow all the way around the stove. Very good. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is break away for a few minutes while my water comes to a boil and uh, I'll show you the lunch that I'm going to make. We'll have coffee afterwards and I'll show you a couple of other new items. All right, water's boiling. The stove seems to be working out really well. Feed some pretty long sticks into the hole in the side. Lunch today is the Happy Yak Moroccan Feast, which is basically lentils, dried fruits, spices, and couscous. Trying to see what else. Oh, there's quite a number of things in here, but those are the primary ingredients in the meal. And of course, I am going to provide a link to this on the Happy Yak website. It requires, oh geez, it only requires 200 mils of water. I boiled plenty of water. So the instructions are 200 mils of water, place into the bag, seal or stir and seal. Stir once or twice for and then 12 to 15 minutes later it is ready. Let's get this going here. Where is my spoon? Oh, whole bay leaves. All right, well, rather than show you now, I think um, what I'm going to do is I won't be eating it out of the bag. I did bring a bowl with me to eat out of, so that's what I'll be using to eat out of. And you'll be able to see what the uh, what it looks like when it's fully rehydrated. I will tell you, red lentils, the fruit that's in there, the apricots, all the spices, couscous, yeah, looking pretty good. So I do need to find my spoon. Where is your spoon? cook kit or my eating kit and where are my gloves so that I can manage to hold on to this thing here we go now I know you can't see what I'm doing here trying to judge 200 mils out of the 500 that I put in here. Can't see with the steam. All right, that looks about right. Let's put a little bit more in. Stir that up. Love the smell. Mm. That is nice. I stir right into the corner, get all of the ingredients mixed into the water. Seal the bag. 
And like I do most of the time in the winter, I have a uh, insulated cozy that I can, or a lunch bag is what it is. I can drop this down inside, seal that up, and if it was any colder, I could wrap something around that. But uh, I don't need to right now because uh, sitting here in the sun, <laughs> I'm actually thinking of taking this jacket off, not putting another one on. Okay, while that is rehydrating, I needed to put a couple pieces of wood in here just to keep the fire going. I don't need it going hard though. Put the pot back on. So, while that is reheating, what I'll do is uh, show you a couple of the things that I brought with me. All right, what else do I have that I want to show you? Actually, what I'm wearing right now, Christmas gift from my daughter. It's appeared, I think, in a couple of videos. Just a nice little red toque. She thought I needed a new look for the woods. Very comfortable little hat. Kind of a moder moderate, not a real cold weather hat, but it's pretty good if it's not, if I'm on the move so that I don't get too hot. Plenty for today right now. So I wanted to give a shout out to my daughter for the Christmas gift. So I have a new knife that I'm testing. I have it set up for neck carry. It's not intended for neck carry. In fact, I don't particularly like carrying it this way, but uh, well, I'll talk more about that in a minute. Then again, not a review. I just want to show you what it is that I have that I'm testing out. Uh, this is the Manly Draugr. So the Manly Draugr sent to me in D2 steel, or at least the German variation of D2 steel, is a well, obviously a fixed full tang knife, full flat grind, three millimeters thick, actually four millimeters thick at the spine. Uh, I'm not going to say too much about it right now. What I will say about it is, for me, the grips are very, very thin. I'm finding them quite thin, and a little un not uncomfortable because there's no hot spots. It's just that it's my hands are so large. Now it's long enough, which is great but it is just too thin through here for me. It does have an exposed pommel, a, a skull crusher, some people call them. Uh, great for smashing shells of shellfish or maybe nuts if you have uh, nuts in your area. Uh, maybe pounding up some bark. Uh, I can't see myself doing that. In fact, what I'm finding is that it actually is a bit annoying in my palm if I want to get back and work with the, uh, the, palm, or the butt of the knife in my palm. But uh, it's there. It's got jimping on top, not overly aggressive, but sufficient. There is jimping kind of recessed in the choil area here. It doesn't bother me. I don't know that it's necessary, but it's there anyway. I did put a little piece of uh, yellow paracord on it in case I drop it, of course. Now the sheath, that's a different story. It's a thermal plastic. I don't think it's a true Kydex sheath. It did come with a belt loop on it. I ended up taking the belt loop off. The belt, the spacing of the holes on the sheath and the belt loop don't match any of the standard setups. So I have a tech lock. I could not put the tech lock on this. It uh, is just rides way too high to sit on my belt. So I thought for the time being, until I, at least until I'm finished testing it, I'll either have to carry it uh, around my neck or in my pack. And I don't like having the knife separated from me if I lay my pack down. So it's, I've been carrying it in the sheath and I've been shaking it hard and I haven't been able to make it fall out so I feel fairly secure that it won't fall out on me even so I don't like carrying it upside down in the neck sheath it's a bit heavy for a neck knife anyway that's all I'm going to say about the manly for dragur for now but that'll appear a few more times before I review it and I have a gift that I can share with you now I'm going to have to put this on in a few minutes for you to see what it is this is something I always wanted to buy for myself. I considered making for myself. I may yet make one, I'm not sure. It's quite an ambitious undertaking. But uh, I had one of my viewers send me a wool anorak that he makes. So his name is Pastor Toby Holland, and he has a small side business uh, known as the Wandering Pastor, and it's on Etsy. And I will, of course, put the links to uh, Toby's website or Etsy site so that you can see the things that he has. But this is one of the items he makes, and he did, well, there is a patch on it, right here, the Wandering Pastor, or Wandering Parson, my apologies, Wandering Parson, his own little design right here. He's an avid outdoorsman, he's been a good follower. 
He sent it to me as a gift, as a thank you for all that I do in terms of videos that I put out. He gave, asked me nothing in return. He didn't even ask for a mention on, you, on a video. But uh, how do you not say thank you publicly for such a nice gift? It is a large, he asked me one time, he didn't tell me what was coming, he just said, Mark, what size coat do you wear? That's all he said. I might have guessed what he was sending, but I would never have guessed somebody's going to send a wool anorak to me. So, uh, it is huge, as you'll see when I put it on, but uh, that's what I want, it would be wanting, is something I can wear over a fleece or an insulated jacket of some type, so that it fits down over top of everything, and it does. And uh, I'll show you that in a few minutes' time. Um... Uh, yeah, what else have I got? Oh, another, some Christmas gifts. I'll be using them for lunch today. This is like a Christmas show and tell well after Christmas. So I have the original uh, Kopilka Kuxa, the eight ounce version. Loved it, carried for a long time. The only complaint I had about it is the size, eight ounces. Uh, you know, it's not bad if you have a pot of coffee on, but if you're just trying to make a single cup of coffee and because you, you don't want to drink a whole pot, eight ounces is not very much, really. Well, my wife and my daughter each chipped in and bought one of the, uh, more on the Kapilka uh, set. So this is the 10 ounce Kapilka cup that I received from one of, either my wife or my daughter over Christmas. I put, uh, just wrapped the handle a little bit of a gutted paracord on it. And the bowl. So I've got the matching bowl and cup. And of course a, a hand carved spoon is what I'll be using to eat with. Very nice. I have used them a few times. You know what? These are great. They really are. They're, if you don't know about Kapilka, they are made from pine and resin com com combined together and then thermal molded into shape. It gives them the look of traditional wood. Uh, it gives you some of that feel. I mean, it's not wood. Don't, don't misunderstand. It's not pure wood. It is wood and resin together, but it retains warmth and it's extremely strong. It holds, you know, the coffee warm enough for a long time. And I'm not worried that this is going to crack either from the heat or from drying out or from being dropped or anything else. So that's what I'm going to have lunch in today. Anything else to share here? No, I think that's it. Now, while my lunch is still rehydrating, I'm going to reposition the camera so I can show you what the uh, anorak looks like on me. All right, I have the anorak on from Toby. And obviously, the, the way the camera is set up, this is long. It is well down past my butt, down mid-thigh. Long in the sleeves, not so long, it just comes down to my knuckles, as you'll see in a second. I'm going to back up so you get an idea of what this is all about. This is, by the way, is a 90% wool jacket. He does have some different mixtures, but this one is 90%. I'm going to put the details of what he did tell me in the show notes. And, of course, as I mentioned, the link to, the, to his Etsy website. But I will see if I can't back up the camera. I don't think even that's going to work. Hopefully you can see most of what I'm wearing here. So it does have the big kangaroo pocket, which is very deep. Paracord drawstring around the, the neck with little brass, uh, rip, not rivets, what do you call them? Grommets, grommets running down the neck. It did have a paracord running around the waist. Uh, what I did is I exchanged it out for some shock cord and a, and a cord lock so that I could I uh, bring it in around my butt to keep some of the wind out. The reason I changed that out was I found with the paracord I could draw it in, but then when I went to kneel or bend it was too tight. So now I, when I kneel and bend the, uh, the shock cord works well for you know, allow, giving me some movement. As I mentioned it is long in the sleeves, but it's not so long that uh, it's, it gets in the way and if I want to I can fold it either up underneath or on the outside, but actually it's perfect the way it is. The hood is not super large, but it is large enough. Uh, there's room to, for me to get my toque back on underneath here. And uh, yeah, there's not a lot more to say about this. I haven't, this is the first time I've worn it out in the woods. I've worn it around the house, I've worn it in the backyard, but this is the first time I've worn it out in the hoods. It's warm, it is warm. Right now I'm very comfortable because I'm not moving around, but I wouldn't be able to hike in this, it would add too much warmth. But once you're sitting still somewhere, it's perfect. You know, what else do you, what else can you ask for in an anorak like this? Yeah, so Toby, thank you very much. I know you didn't ask me to talk about this, but I wanted to thank you publicly. And as I mentioned, hopefully a few people will take a look at your site and, and see what you have to offer.
All right, it's been, I think, probably 15 minutes anyway since I put this nice and warm. Perfect, okay. I will transfer it into the bowl and then I'll come over and show you what it looks like before I give it a taste test. But first, the smell test. Ah. Man, that's nice. Always is, but... Holy crap, this is a, oh my lord, this is a huge meal. Can I eat all this? I guess if I couldn't eat it all, I could leave some back in the bag, just seal it up, and reheat it again later. But it smells like something I could eat. All right, let me see if I can get up to the camera. So here is lunch today. This is the Moroccan feast. There's all kinds of things. Red lentils, couscous, and the fruit and spices that are in there. So let me go back to my seat now that you have seen it, and uh, I'll give you a taste test. Moroccan feast. Lentils, dried fruit, spices, and couscous. Let's see. What does it taste like? Okay. So, as with all the Happy Yak meals so far, it is not salty. I know I say it, but it is true. This is not one of your salty meals. I don't know if I mentioned this. It is from their vegetarian lineup, so there is no meats in this at all. It's also a lactose-free meal. So those, those things are on the, uh, on the label and will be on the information I put in the show notes. It does include 28 grams of protein, though. So that would be a vegetable source protein. Mm. The overall flavor... It's not what I call super spicy, it's more savory. But then you would hit some of the fruit that's in here. What fruit is in here? I have to see. I was pretty sure I saw apricots, dates. Apricots, almonds. What were the dark ones? Oh, raisins, raisins. Hmm. Texture is amazing, just as you would expect from any of the Happy Yak meals. Just something different. Taste is not overpowering. It is just a little bit sweet and a little bit savory at the same time, but very enjoyable. The texture is just perfect. I couldn't have done this myself at home. Mm, that's nice. Okay, while it's still warm, I'm going to eat this, and then it's coffee time. I don't know if a day in the woods can be considered complete unless you're having coffee. And I know not everybody likes coffee, but uh, those who do know what I'm talking about. Water's back on to boil. Gives me a few minutes to do coffee the proper way. And what I mean by the proper way is not instant. Yes, I've done many of videos on instant coffee, and instant coffee has its place, and there are some good instant coffees, but nothing beats fresh roasted, fresh ground coffee, prepared in a nice method. My favorite method is the AeroPress, which is what I'm going to use today. Cowboy coffee. Wade, I know I can't convert you. Wait, cowboy coffee is good. Don't, don't get me wrong, folks. I like cowboy coffee, too. I just happen to prefer the AeroPress. That's, that's my favorite way of making coffee. Uh, I do have a little mocha pot that I think I'll bring out. Someone mentioned mocha pots recently. Boy, that, that stove brought two cups of water to a boil. And smoke in my face, but really fast. I do have a mocha pot I think I'll bring out sometime. I'm going to do a few more videos on coffee in the woods. Things that you probably already have that are probably going to work just fine. Used, uh, used in a way that uh, you adapt into your, your process of the woods. 
All right, I gotta work on this a little quicker than I thought I had to. So, what am I gonna do here? I have just the top half of my grinder. The bottom half is not necessary if you grind directly into your air press, which is what I'm gonna do. Coffee today, as it has been for quite a while now, is the Rampage coffee. Roast it right here in Canada, and I have a video on that. Of course, I've probably got a few videos on this by now. Very freshly roasted. Oh, man. What I'm using now is a mixture of their Code Black and their Rye. Code Black is their very dark roast. Their Rye is their medium roast. So if I go about 50-50 split, it's a nice full-bodied, still feels like a dark roast without having that overly, overly strong dark roast flavor. Not that I mind that, that this is just lightens it up a little bit. So I have to put a few spoonfuls of that into the grinder. I have a little spoon that I have just for coffee. A little spoon that I carved. So I figure three tablespoons of beans. A little extra for luck. Could always use luck. And the handle. And the process is just as simple as handle on top of grinder. Grind directly into the AeroPress. Takes a while. And then we'll add the water. So when I'm finished doing this, we'll add the water and make some coffee. So my coffee's ground. It's in the AeroPress. I'm using the inverted method of the AeroPress today. It's a Somewhere between fine and coarsely ground. There's no one way of doing this. Put my glove on to pour my water in. Now the water, I'm just going to take it off and put it on the snow only for a couple of seconds. And the only reason that you do that is water should be just off of boiling. Depending on what authority you listen to, between 92 and 102 degrees is what your water should be, Fahrenheit of course, and not at the 112 boiling temperature. Just a few seconds off of the boil here, and that should be ready. Stabilize the cup so it doesn't tip over. Give it a little stir, make sure all the coffee's engaged. Ooh, nice crema on top, the foam that builds up. Put the filter cap on. Now again, depending on who the authority is, you can leave it sit for a couple of minutes. The truth is, the, strong, the longer it sits, the stronger the coffee will get but also the more bitter it will get. So you do have to, well, experience is the only way to know what is the right amount of time. I'm just gonna let it for a second. I'm gonna add a little bit of snow to my pot because I need something to wash my dishes out. And I'll put that back on the water, on the fire. And where's my mug? Here we go. Now it's as simple as mug down, AeroPress turned over. Ooh, this mug is almost too big for the AeroPress. I never thought of that. And push. Not too fast, just a nice, even, steady pressure. You'll hear a little hiss of air at the end. I like to draw back a quarter inch. It just makes it easier when I go to expel the puck. But there it is. That's the end of the pushing. Now, I have probably six of the 10 ounces that can go in this cup. So I can do one of two things. Drink it straight and strong or add a little bit of water to it. It all depends on how you like your coffee. Uh, since I just put snow in my water, I'm just going to drink it the way it is. Because it'll take a while before I've got any more boiling water. And that is a cup of fresh 
roasted coffee. You know, it's amazing what a day in the woods can do for your soul. It doesn't even have to be as nice as it is today, any day in the woods. But today, this is one of those days that will go down in my memories as not what I planned on doing, but maybe the best days are like that. The plans don't go the way you expected them to, but they turn out maybe better. And I think that's kind of what today was. I didn't find the spot I wanted to get to. I ended up just pulling in off of the path a little way, setting up my stove, making my lunch, having some coffee. But the stillness and the quiet right now, when you can hear your heart beating, you know it's quiet. And you add a little cup, not a little, a nice big cup of coffee to that. For those of us who love coffee, it just tops it off nicely. I'm looking out over the lake in that direction. The lake is frozen. I have been listening to the lake buckling and making sounds. I always love that groaning sound. It can be a little intimidating when you're out on the ice and you hear one of those waves of buckling ice coming towards you and roaring as it comes towards you and you wonder if it's just going to erupt under your feet. But it hasn't. It's plenty thick. It's got to be 8 to 10 inches thick. I mean, it's thick enough to drive vehicles on without question. Just have to stay away from open water. So that's what I'm going to do today. Well, now it's a couple of hours left. That's a nice thing about late winter, right? The sun sets a little later in the day. So I'm going to enjoy my coffee, pack my bag, start heading back up the trail towards the uh, where I park my car. But I'm likely going to find at least a couple of things that I can show you along the way. I may make it easier on myself and get off the icy trails and just walk across the lake. I do have my crampons and I do have my ice picks that I carry. Uh, down through my sleeves just in case I go through the ice. Not likely, but it's always nice to have them. But for, before I do that, I have to finish my coffee and I'm not going to rush that. I thought I'd try something I haven't done for a while, which is to use my hiking pole as a selfie stick with my little Gorilla Pod wrapped around the end of it. And I'll do a 360 degree turn here. I'm out on Susie Lake about well, actually, only about 40 yards from uh, shore, 40 meters or so from shore. But uh, just to give an idea of what it looks like out here on the lake this time of day. Beautiful. You'll be looking into the west. Of course, the sun is getting low. What a gorgeous day to be out here on the ice. And the ice is actually... Could have brought skates. Would have been all over the place here. Man. A little while ago, I, well, when I first went, came out, it's late day now. But when I first came out, I went, uh, I showed you a look-off point. I said it's my favorite place to overlook the lake. That's it behind me up on the hill up there. I know it doesn't look very high from here, but uh, that's where I was looking out over the lake here. Just wanted to share that with you. Okay, well you can probably tell by the shadows behind me. I'm looking directly into the sun. This may not have been the best camera setup. Move back and forth, try to get it out of my eyes. But you can probably tell from the shadows behind me that it's late afternoon. It's that time of day of long shadows, as we like to say. Uh, temperature's starting to drop. I don't have a thermometer, but I suspect we're back down minus 14, maybe even minus 15 right now. Even so, I have my wool and a rack strapped to the back of my backpack. My fleece is wide open, so just that my base layer, and I'm getting a little damp underneath here, that's why I've got it open, because you just can't get wet. If you get wet and you stop, you get cold. It's just that simple. So thermoregulation is the term I'm uh, gonna start using for this. I used to say moisture management. Don't get wet. Try not to move so fast that you perspire a lot. Uh, that's difficult, so minimize it. Wear the proper wicking layers so they move the moisture away from the outside of your body and try to stay as dry. I guess the idea is to hike comfortably cool. Not cold, so you're shivering, but comfortably cool. 
and then when you stop, throw your layers on because then you will warm up, you'll be warm inside and your layers will uh, retain that heat so you don't lose it. Anyway, like I said, it's the end of the day. I've still got another half hour to get out. What I did after I uh, finished up my lunch and had my coffee is I continued on for another half hour, 40 minutes, looking for the spot that I had hoped to find in the first place. I still didn't find it. I don't know where it is. I'm going to have to go looking after the snow is gone and then mark it somehow. I didn't want to mark it, the trail into it, because I just didn't want to invite people to go in and explore and see what was in there. Uh, it's not that it's mine alone, but you know, you just kind of like to have a private spot of your own when you're in the woods. This is a public wilderness, but at the same time, if there's a place I can find that other people don't go to, that's what I want to have so I can leave a few things set up like tripods and, you know, fire pit, that type of thing, and maybe even leave some wood behind for myself. Uh, I wouldn't mind it if other people used the wood as long as they replaced it, but that's not usually the case. In any case, again, the end of the day. It's been a wonderful day. I, uh, I can't say enough, you know, about getting out into the woods. It does not matter the temperature. It really doesn't. It's a matter of figuring out what you need to bring in order to stay comfortable. So pack a few layers. I've got another down jacket, an inexpensive down jacket in my backpack that I could have brought out if I had to, but geez, like I said, I'm trying to stay cool as it is in minus 15. I'm trying not to overheat, so I didn't need that. Good to have, just in case something happened. I have a tarp and everything else I need to stay overnight. But uh, now I'm only half an hour out, so. This is a long, rambling way of saying thank you for coming along on this hike. I hope you enjoyed it. I invite you to leave any comments on anything you saw in the video or anything you'd like to see in future videos. But I'll always be sure to bring my camera along and, and bring you so you can enjoy what I enjoy when I get out here in the woods. Bye for now.